This month's Where Did the Road Go is brought to you by eight amazing people. Greg Ross, Illuminati, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Michael Fritschke, Dr. O in Teberg, and Doug Malam. Thank you all so very much for helping make this show possible. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And I am here once again with Travis Watson. Hello, Travis. Also known as W. Yeah, also known as W.T. Watson, for those of you who are looking for me on Amazon. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. I forgot, to, I forgot to mention that last last week. You you go by Travis, but you write under W.T. That's right. I, yeah, I know. I, I just enjoy being a man of mystery, I guess. And let's, let's not mention your Facebook's also under another name. Yeah, well, there's a long story behind that. But yeah, my <laughs> Facebook is under Will Watson, or you can find me under W.T. Watson, author. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> So your latest book here that we talked about last week was uh, the Forest Poltergeist. It was indeed, and and we were speaking of rabbit holes. We had discussed how this book was a little more difficult for me to write because there were so many rabbit holes to go down to once I got into this topic, and so many um, perspectives too. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, again, you know, as, as I said last time. This is a topic that could very easily have turned into one of those great big massive two volume sets yeah. that you know that certain authors that we know put out. <laughs> Hi Joshua, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know it very could have easily could have turned out that way. But you know, as I was explaining last time, I, I'm yeah, you know, I really like to write concise books that give people an introduction to an idea and then let them run with it. Um, you know, because I, m- my greatest fear is turning into one of those um, those Victorian writers who, you know, the, the the manual of psychic whatever, and <laughs> you know, they'll they'll say we have this idea, and then you know, fifty pages later, they have cited every single solitary case that they can think of that might even be remotely related to whatever that topic was, and by the time you get to the end of that section, you've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I just don't want to be that guy. <laughs> well, you know, they, they had so more time back be, then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, they had, uh, they, they, they weren't as as rushed in modern life as we were. But um, you know, I, I just, I want people to read the book and go, wow, there's a lot of stuff in this book, but it's really tight. <laughs> you know? um, so that's that's kind of what I strive for, and. You know, I, I think I was fairly successful with this one, even though, you know, I really, really had a tough time, you know, kind of compressing things down into a workable size because <laughs> um, there's so much information out there. When you start to delve into that, to the poltergeist realm and you go yeah, down the yeah. different rabbit holes, the things that go bump in the night, you know, and, and uh, you know, the, the book is, is, is testimony to, you know. Uh, all the different weirdness that you can get into when you start to discuss that topic. So what, uh, let, let, um, let's talk about Olive Hill. Okay. Um, yeah, just to back up for, for a second, yeah. since we're, we're kind of starting over here, you know, the forest poltergeist is specifically about what the BFRO calls class B encounters. In other words, the disturbances that people run into in the wilderness, things like rock throwing, Wood knocks, uh, tracks, vocalizations, <clears throat> you know, and and, and uh, you know, nest sites and those kinds of things. It's about where people see these things, they encounter these things, but they never actually see a Sasquatch. Um, and you know, we were talking last time about how uh, you and had come up with this idea that if you took all of this stuff and you put it in a house, you'd have a poltergeist case. And I found that really interesting. And after talking with you and some other folks, I, I ran with it. And, and that's what this book is about. It's about uh, the uh, maybe non-physical or paranormal component of 
uh, some, if not all, of these Class B uh, encounters that people are having. And that's how we, we wandered around to talking about poltergeists, um, because that's what people call these kinds of disturbances if you see them in a house. You know, if, if something is throwing rocks at you in your house, you have a poltergeist. You know, if somebody something is rapping hard on your, uh, you know, on your walls or on your tables or whatever, you have a poltergeist. Um, in the same way, if something's throwing, but for some reason, if we translate that out into the woods, if something's throwing rocks at you or banging on trees, it must be Sasquatch, right? Right. And you know, my view is that we need to get out of the silo. And we need to look at the Sasquatch phenomena from 10,000 foot uh, uh, viewpoint and look at all of the other wide range of uh, phenomena out there, strange phenomena out there that could also be uh, a factor in these class, particularly the black class B encounters. I mean, we can even probably explain some of the class A encounters with things like apparitions, but you know, that's something else again. Right. Um, so when I started the book, you know, I, I started off explaining to people, okay, this is what a class B encounter is, which is what I kind of just did. And then I want, wanted to uh, uh, um, introduce people to the idea of the poltergeist and what poltergeists are, what, what a, what, what's kind of entailed in a poltergeist haunting. And, and I wanted to take some cases that were a little bit different. Um, you know, everybody's, you know, I, I mean, I do quote rather extensively from the Enfield case, but I don't actually profile that one in the book. Um, you know, there are some cases that a lot of people know about. So I tried to pick some cases from, you know, like Colin Wilson and so forth, who's who literally wrote the book on poltergeist um, that were different. And one of those that was different, uh, William Roll, who's well known in parapsychological circles. He's the guy I'm pretty certain who came up with the theory of uh, random spontaneous psychokinesis. In other words, yeah. basically the poltergeist is a psychic temper tantrum uh, from, uh, you know, some individual in uh, at the site who's got repressed emotions of some kind or, you know, they're prepubescent or you know, something in their life is really roiling them emotionally and they're not able to express that outwardly. So the theory is that, that that energy turns within and manifests itself in this in this um, uh, outbreak of psychokinetic activity. Um, William Roll came up with that, as far as I know, is the the guy who sort of came up with that idea. And um, one of the, the the cases that he's well known for uh, happened in Olive Hill, Kentucky. Um, you know, and. In some ways, it's very, very typical kind of poltergeist outbreak. Um, you know, it started with um, these folks' parents in their house, you know, with the, you know, knocking and the shuffling around of, uh, of things in the house, but not real outright blatant poltergeisty stuff. And then things started falling off the walls and shattering. Um, and, it, you know, and at one point, the, uh, the, uh, the grandmother of this family, uh, who uh, had encountered a, um, or claimed that she had seen an apparition of uh, someone who had uh, lived in the house that they were living in previously. Well, the activity got so bad that um, these folks actually moved. And when they did that, apparently the activity shifted itself over to um, their kid's house. Um, now, the common denominator in this was one of the sons uh, who used to come a little, uh, I believe he was 10, maybe 12, who would go over to his grandparents regularly to uh, to help with chores and that kind of thing. Um, and that's the, he seemed to be the focus for this particular case. Well, they went to, the, the activities started kicking up at this boy's parents' house after this. <clears throat> You know, after these other people have been forced to move. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and again, you know, you started having things moving around in the house. You started having things flying around in the house. All of this, this stuff was starting to happen. It was enough that it actually made the papers. And one of William Roll's um, graduate students or researchers um, who was in the, in the area uh, came by to um, actually explore, you know, see if this was a case that, you know, Roll might be interested in coming out and, and taking a look at. And, you know, when he first got there, absolutely nothing going on. Uh, but shortly after that, 
he was witness to, uh, if I remember correctly, he was sitting in the room uh, with the kids in general. And uh, on the top of the television set, um, there were there was a clock and then there were some other items. And he watched as the clock went one way and the other items went the other way onto the floor. Um, and there was nobody around for that to happen. So right. he calls up his, his, uh, uh, you know, his mentor, uh, William Roll, who comes to the house. Um, by this time, this good church going family, the, the mother had become convinced by members of her church that of course they had demons, uh, in the house. And, um, so she was not particularly cooperative, but Roll did get to stay there for a couple of days. And, uh, the big thing that he observed, um, and let's cross cut the Sasquatch for a minute. One of the, the things that Sasquatches are famous for, supposedly, um, according to all the research, is that they like to build these nest things or these structures um, out in the woods. You know, you'll find the, the structures that look like an arch or kind of look like a little um, little blind or whatever, or, you know, trees that have been set cross crosswise to each other or all kinds of different things, some of which could be explained by tree fall. Um, but, you know, some of which look like they've been kind of intelligently um, manufactured. The thing that I point out is that in the Olive Hill case, as in other cases, other poltergeist cases, the poltergeist had a, um, a, a penchant for uh, rearranging its environment to suit it. Uh, yeah. The most, the best example of that happened uh, Roll was following this young man, this focus person, into the um, into the kitchen. The boy was going to get a drink, uh, probably going to bed because it was late at night. And as the boy was uh, approaching the the, uh, the kitchen sink and started to fill his glass, um, off to their right, if I remember correctly, um, the kitchen table suddenly levitated itself turned itself up to, upside down and then set itself down precisely on the dining room chairs so that it was sitting there upside down, forming a little structure, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, Roll was like, oh, wow, you know, uh, you know, he wanted to take pictures of this and all this kind of stuff. And mom was like, nope, not doing it. You people need to get the hell out of my house. Um, it, you know, which is essentially what happened for some reason is she felt that, um, their presence, the scientist's presence there, even though Roll had tried to explain to her about his RS, RSPK theory, she felt that his presence there was really, um, Disruptive. exacerbating the situation. Yeah. It was exacerbating the situation. Um, well, what we know is that after Roll and his, his sidekick left, um, the disturbances continued. Um, and that uh, they didn't seem to calm down until the family actually went on a vacation to Ohio, if I remember right. Um, and, uh, you know, the things seemed to settle down. And this is, again, a very typical uh, poltergeist pattern where you get this, uh, you know, this disturbance that's fairly mild at the beginning, and then ramps up and then starts to decline um, at, at a certain point. So, um you know, so, you know, Olive Hill is, is kind of a classic, classic poltergeist case. And, you know, as I said, one of the, the things that was important to me in that case was that this poltergeist liked to rearrange things. Yeah. You know, there was a, there was a, a, an incident, not just, you know, destroy things like a lot of, a lot of poltergeists will leave you with all of your dishes broken and stuff. <laughs> um, in, in this particular case, uh, there was also a circumstance where, uh, Roll and, and some of the family were sitting in in living room, and uh, behind them was a coffee table that they later weighed in at like fifty or sixty pounds. It was made out of a, a big old piece of wood, apparently. Um, this thing just up and flipped itself over too, uh, without you know anybody being even close to it. The closest person to it was the daughter of the house. And, you know, there was just no way this, this child could have even picked up this coffee table, much less flipped it over without anybody seeing or do it. Um, which kind of brings me to another, another point is that, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of people are, there's a lot of um, instances where poltergeist activity is, is attributed to somebody, at, you know, as a hoaxer. Right. Um, because somebody gets caught, you know, helping the poltergeist along, basically. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, I mean, uh, if you have a poltergeist in your house and all of this weird stuff is happening 
and you have people coming in and they're they're asking you questions and they're taking pictures and they're doing all this ghost hunting stuff and all this stuff. You know, that kind of notoriety can be kind of addictive for some, certain yes. people. So yeah. if there's nothing going on, they'll make something happen. Right. Well, and that's- my thing is that my thing is that, yeah, that could be. Um, and, and, and it may be that in even the best poltergeist cases, there are some instances where people are doing things to kind of help the, 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 uh, the incident along. But. That doesn't, you know, it's like if you bought a Sasquatch out of the woods, that doesn't take away from all the weird stuff that's that's been reported out there related to Sasquatch. Right. Same thing with poltergeist. Just because somebody, you know, threw something on the floor or whatever, doesn't mean that the, the that it just automatically negates everything that happened in this house. Um, yeah, it's so, just a, a point that I wanted to make. Yeah, so, and the thing is that that sort of... Thing tends to happen because the the person who's like stressed out, who's who's spontaneously creating this energy, when they get attention, like in the Enfield case, suddenly they were the focus of all this attention, and it was oh yeah, they they liked it. So that stress went away, and hence the poltergeist started to go right. away, and then they started faking it because they right. didn't want the attention to go away. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing is like you mentioned how the how the activity kind of starts slow, hits a peak, and then just kind of declines. Uh, mm-hmm. You see the same thing in flaps of monster sightings and the same oh, yeah, thing in yeah. flaps of UFO sightings. They behave oh, exactly yeah, the same way. Mm-hmm. That was yeah, what, I, I mean, that was the, what uh, Willette wrote about in Illuminations, how UFO flaps mimic poltergeist cases. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, I mean, you have, you know, and again, backing up and taking a much more, you know, overview level look at all this stuff, you start to see these patterns. The reason people don't see these patterns is because they're stuck in their silo. You know, I am a Sasquatch researcher and that's what I do, you know, or I am a UFO researcher and that's what I do, or I am a ghost hunter and that's what I do. You know, and and if you don't get out of that silo and take a a more overview approach to all this stuff, you miss these patterns. But yeah, UFO flaps start off, you know, oh, well, somebody saw a UFO and then there's a whole bunch of UFOs and then there's people seeing UFOs all over the place and then it kind of dies down, right? Same thing with monster sightings or, uh, you know, I mean, even, even, you know, the Sasquatch is notoriously solitary, but, um, you know, you get uh, groups of sightings, um, you know, in, in certain places. I can't think of one right off the top of my head, but, you know, there are places where, you get the sightings on a fairly regular basis, and sometimes there's more of them, and sometimes there's less of them. Like, like uh, British like some, Columbia comes to mind because it's just like that, you know. Or, or cases like Momo or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you have, uh, you know, somebody sees something, and then all of a sudden everybody in town is seeing it. Yeah. Um, yeah, Momo's a, a great example of that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, or, you know, you have the whole Bray Road thing that happened yeah. with Dog Man. Yeah. So this is if you if you are familiar with a whole bunch of different kinds of uh, weirdness, then you realize, oh, wait, this poltergeist thing falls into the same pattern as all this other stuff does. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it starts off small and then it ramps its way up and then it it declines. It builds energy and then the energy is released. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't know what's causing that energetic anomaly, but we can be pretty certain that that has something to do with it, that there's some kind of energetic anomaly that's producing this stuff. So, yeah. Uh, But we see that in poltergeist cases and all of this other monster stuff and so forth. So, I mean, it's Um, it's just, go ahead. In the Olive Hill case, too, you talk about uh, Mm -hmm. a picture of Jesus falling off the wall. So for someone who's religious to begin with, uh, if it was another picture, it wouldn't have mattered. But the fact that it was a picture of Jesus makes demon come to mind almost Mm -hmm. immediately. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. If, as if the poltergeist was like, "Ooh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna knock down Jesus," you know, rather than I'm just knocking a picture down. Well, one of the things that we see in poltergeist case and, and cases, and and again, if you cross the the road into the Sasquatch land and and you look at Class B encounters, is there's this element of mischievousness about a lot of this stuff. Now, sometimes it's just outright hostile. You know, it's like the polter, poltergeist is trying to chase you out of your freaking house. Same way with Sasquatches, right? You know, the the whole Class B thing where someone's chased out of the woods by something throwing stones at them or, or you know, there's these loud roars coming from the woods or whatever. Um, so, uh, 
<laughs> I just lost my train of thought entirely. <laughs> uh, we were talking about uh, the, the picture of Jesus getting knocked off the wall. Picture of Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, if you have somebody who's having a poltergeist experience and they are, you know, of a particular religious bent, um, then what better way to get somebody's goat, literally, than than to uh, you know to fool around with their their religious icons, sure. right? Um, we saw the same thing happen in the Black Monk of Paltry, Paltry which is where I case, wanted to go which next. I talk about. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, you know, but yeah, in this particular case, these the mom at least Olive Hill, the mom at least was convinced by her you know elders in her church or whatever that she had a demon that there were demons that were plaguing them. Yeah. Um, and I think that this energy, whatever it is, whether it's manifesting out in the woods or whether it's manifesting in your house, whatever this thing is, it picks up on stuff like that and it'll play to it. You know, um, you know, it'll, it'll shatter your, your, your pictures of Jesus and it'll, you know, it'll, it'll throw your Bible across the room and it'll do these things, not because it's a demon, but because it's trying to get your, your attention. It's, yeah. It, it wants to get your goat. It literally wants to get your goat. Um, and it's usually very successful because it knows just what buttons to push. Because whatever it is, it seems to be sitting around listening to people talk about it. Um, <laughs> right. And it responds to that. It, it definitely responds to that. So in the Black Monk case, there was, uh, oh. was, it, was it the aunt who came over? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> who found her missing glove floating in the air when she started to sing a hymn. Mm-hmm. The glove mockingly directed the tune for her. Yep, yep, exactly. So the Black Monk case is, I mean, this is Colin Wilson at his best. Yes. Um, this is in in his book, Poltergeist. And um, this case is just, uh, th- there, as he says at the end of, of, of uh, citing the case, you know, there's just, all, there's really almost nothing like it because you name it in the poltergeist world and it happened in, in the Black Moon case. You know, there were apparitions, there were, there was stuff getting moved around. There's, uh, you know, there were apports, there's all kinds of stuff happened in this case. So um, just briefly, um, it starts out uh, with the, the, uh, the there's the, the two parents and then there's two kids one of whom's a little bit older than the other. Um, and the boy who I believe was 15 at the time this started, uh, 15 or 16, uh, had decided not to go on holiday with the family. And instead he was kind of hanging around the house and uh, his grandmother was keeping an eye on him. There, you know, he, he's been outside reading. Um, the grandmother is sitting in the, um, uh, in the sitting room, the solarium or whatever you want to call it of this house, uh, knitting. And... <laughs> She starts to realize as the boy comes in that there's this white substance settling uh, all throughout the room. It's like it's like dust or ash falling from someplace and settling on all the furniture and, and, and the carpets and, and everything all throughout the room. But the weird thing about this is that this stuff, whatever it is, just seems to be appearing like three quarters of the way up in the room and, and falling just like, like it's falling out of nowhere yeah. <laughs> you know, and then settling over the room. And she's like, you know, what's causing this? And the boy, of course, you know, being 15 or 16 immediately becomes defensive. It's like, it's not me. I didn't do anything. <laughs> so there's this weirdness happening. And then, uh, you know, then they, they ha- began having a problem with water puddles forming in the house just randomly. And it was so bad that they actually called the local water board and they came in and checked all the pipes in the house, checked everything, checked all the connections, did all the, the, the plumber stuff, right? Nothing wrong. Absolutely nothing wrong. Yeah. Then they start getting the banging in the walls, um, you know, which, you know, they ended up calling the, 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 the local constabulary who came and, and they heard it too. And they went and looked all around the house and they, they couldn't find anything, Right. Um, but what tore it for them is that night they went to bed and um, the grandmother comes in to wish the boy good night. And as he's looking over her shoulder, watching his t- chest of drawers dancing across the room <laughs> in his room, he's like, that's it. They were both out of there. They went and spent the night uh, at uh, uh, relatives who, who lived close by. Um, so the uh, the activity ramped up. For a little bit, and then it died down. 
and they figured, oh, okay, well, we're, we're done with that. And, um, you know, I don't know, that was really weird. I, I'm, I'm not sure what that was all about, but anyway, it's, it's done now. When the girl reached her teenage years, which is a couple of years later, the activity started up again. Um, only this time it got really bad. Um, they had, uh, you know, I mean, there was so much stuff going on in this case that you really, you need to read the book Yeah, because there's so much stuff going on in this case that I can't even really do it justice. But some of the highlights, uh, one of my favorites was the, the case of the disappearing eggs. Um, the, uh, the mom, <laughs> This, this poltergeist liked to announce its presence with smell. Um, and if it was in a good mood, you know, quote unquote, then they got pleasant smells. And if it was in a bad mood, they got raunchy smells, which we can, again, correlate back to the Bigfoot thing, right? Right. Um, so uh, what was happening is that the eggs in the refrigerator were somehow making their way out of the refrigerator and basically floating out into the kitchen and exploding in these wonderful smelling scent bombs. Now, explain that one. Right. I, mean, I would love to see some, some you know, scientific materialist physicist try to explain that one. Um, so this happened several times. And finally, the mom got fed up, she took the, 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 uh, the eggs out of the, the refrigerator, got a milk crate, set the milk crate down on top of the eggs, and then sat down on the milk crate. And it still kept happening. <laughs> So the eggs were just apporting themselves out of this milk crate and out into the kitchen at random and making these, you know, beautiful scent bombs. Uh, that was that was a really interesting uh, occasion. Um, they had a, uh, a a priest come in um, to talk to the family about doing an exorcism because mm -hmm. the the thing had, had gotten so bad, and he was very skeptical about the whole thing. Um, and, and he's, he's, and he's about to leave and all of a sudden a, uh, a candlestick that was sitting on the mantel place falls off, uh, onto the, the living room floor. And he's like, oh, the building's subsiding. That's, you know, that's perfectly natural. There's, there's nothing to, you know, nothing to see here. Right. At which point a second candlestick floats out off of the mantelpiece out into the middle of the room and then falls down into the middle of the floor. <laughs> Which you know gave this priest pause. Right. Um, he was he was not not interested in, in all that. Uh, you know, and we don't have any real record of what happened after that, which I found very amusing. It's like I wonder if that guy just didn't beat feet out of there and never come back. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, because, you know, it was like, okay, my whole, you know, view of the world just got changed a little bit. So, right. Um, right. And then, and then, of course, there's the aunt who came to stay, who really got the, the treatment where, you know, I mean, in, in one circumstance, she's sitting in the kitchen and the refrigerator door opens, the milk comes out of the refrigerator and pours itself <laughs> over her head. Yeah. You know? I mean, and, you know, and then, um, you know, you, you described the incident with the glove where you know, she was missing. Other, They basically, you know, because the lights kept going out, weird stuff kept happening. And she was saying, oh, it's the kids doing it while the lights are out. They're like, if you don't believe us, stay the night. Yeah. And she did. And she she left the next day proclaiming that there's no way that she would ever spend the night in that house again, not even if they gave her 20,000 pounds. And and this was quite a quite a a long quite a while ago so right, that was right. a, a lot of considerable money. sum of money um the interesting thing though was that after they tried to get rid of the poltergeist um you know when when the priest came and they were talking about exorcisms and all that kind of stuff and and then after uh one of their relatives came in and said the the catholic prayers and did the holy water thing the uh, the poltergeist phenomena actually actually got worse. Yeah, and it took on an anti it took on a very anti Christian uh, slant at that point. Um, they went out to, to church on on Easter Sunday and came back to find that the poltergeist had had spray painted upside down crosses on the wall. Right, um, right. Uh, yeah, amongst other things. Um, so it, it took on a very and again. If you are of a, apparently these people weren't of a terribly strong religious bent, but if you had been the family from Olive Hill, that would have been enough to convince you right there that you were dealing with demons, right? Sure, absolutely. But really all it was, was, was this entity going, ah, you're trying to get rid of me. Guess what? <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> um, 
And, and finally, um, as the activity was was kind of reaching its peak, there were several uh, sightings of what the uh, the apparition that gave this case its name is a black monk. Uh, a, a, a monk in a black hooded robe that was seen uh, by a couple of people in the house. Um, another interesting corollary to the whole uh, Sasquatch thing, um, you know, everybody's like, oh, well, the thing that really proves that Sasquatch exists is tracks, right? We have all these tracks. Yeah. In the black monk case, you know, as I mentioned, they had a problem with water, right? Uh, just spontaneous puddles of water forming in places that it shouldn't be forming where, you know, there was no glasses spilled or anything like that. It just, it just happened, right? Um, the mom comes downstairs one day and finds that the runner in the hallway uh, that leads up to the to the uh, to the, the front door is saturated. I mean, it's just soaking wet. And as she's standing there, she's watching this uh, whatever it is make big footprints down the runner of this carpet. You know, in in the soggy in the in the on, on the soggy carpet in the water, right? Yeah, just. <laughs> You know, right down the 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 the, uh, the runner toward the front door. Um, so it left footprints. Um, I, I mentioned another case where uh, you know it's from uh, one of Han, from Hans Holzer's uh, ghost book, um, where this woman actually encounters an older lady in her uh, in her garden. Yes. Um, and uh, you know, this is more of a haunting ghost story case, but it's still an example of a paranormal phenomenon leaving tracks. Because she's talking to this woman, she has the woman in the house. They talk about because this woman says, "Oh well, I used to live. You know, I actually built this house. You know, I used to live here." And so she's like, "Oh well, come look." And you know, she, there's some uncomfortable things when the woman points out a chair where her husband died and that kind of stuff. But overall, the conversation seems to be fairly uh, benign. Um, they go back out into the garden, and this woman, this older woman, is talking about how she just loved the roses. So the lady of the house thought it would be nice to send some roses home with this nice little old lady, right? Yeah. So she turns around to get something to cut some roses for. When she turns back, this woman is gone. She's like, well, first of all, how did this older woman move that fast? But, you know, you know, she doesn't know whether she was being rude or she just couldn't take it. She was over emotionally overwhelmed or whatever. Um, she comes to find out, talking to her neighbor, that this woman had been dead for some years yeah. before she talked to her that day. But the thing that, that really freaked her out was that this woman left tracks in the garden uh, before she left. Um, so, you know, I mean, again, you have an example of a seemingly uh, ephemeral, uh, apparition, you know, that seems solid enough to where this woman was actually having a conversation with it. Right. And then it leaves tracks. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, all of these things, you know, we talked about the vocalizations last time and how, uh, how, uh, Terrell in his apparitions book talks about this, this one apparition that actually yelled so loud, it actually set somebody's set, set somebody back, uh, on their heels. Now, the point that, that I'm making all through the book is that all of these people are talking about, yeah, this is definitely a sign that Sasquatch is present in this area. And I can look at every one of those things and say, there's definitely a case in poltergeist lore where poltergeist has done that. Right, right. Every one, every one of them. Every one of them. And the, <laughs> and, and the thing is, I mean, finding what looks like large primate tracks in an area that you believe a, a large primate lives in is exactly what you expect. It's a very logical conclusion to come to. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you are, you know, if you have concluded that such and such an area is a Bigfoot hotspot, and I, I don't like either one of those terms, but, you know, if you've decided that that's the case, then if you have a phenomena and energy in the woods that is behaving like a poltergeist and it's listening to all this stuff, then it's going to say, Oh, cool. I'm going to leave 16 inch tracks down on the riverbed. That'll really get them going. <laughs> you know, I mean, and the more detailed I can make them, the better they, you know, the more they yeah. get going. Um, you know, and again, and you know, I'm not discounting the idea that there could be a bipedal primate out there, yeah. you know, especially in, in some of the wilder wilderness areas. I'm, I'm okay with that, but I, I still think there's something mysterious going on out there in the woods too. Um, so, so if we look at stone throwing, you have uh, an entire mm -hmm. chapter on stone throwing. And one of the quotes here was, uh, more than one witness has said he, he, that bears and other forest animals do not throw stones. 
and noted cryptozoologist Ken Gerhard in his book, The Essential Guide to Bigfoot, comments that unless there is a secret society of deep woods catapult enthusiasts, uh, this phenomenon seems quite inexplicable. Yep, yep. And, and it is inexplicable. But that doesn't mean we have to automatically default to, you know, a, a large bipedal primate throwing stones. Um, again, <laughs> you know, like I said, if you give me an example of something that Bigfoot or Sasquatch is supposed to do out in the woods, I can give you an example of a poltergeist that did that. Yeah. The classic stone throwing example in, uh, in Guy Lyon Playfair's book on the, um, I think it was in This House is Haunted, which is the Enfield Poltergeist book, but it might be his other book that's, um, oh, I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head. That's right. Um, something about dimensions, but um, they're, they're both in the bibliography for my book. So, yeah. uh, you know, you can find it. Uh, he talks about a case in Brazil, which is a hotbed of UFO activity too, yes, all kinds of wild UFO stuff that happens there. Um, he talks about a case where, uh, a poltergeist case, where um, the focus for this was a, a 10-year-old girl, if I remember correctly. And um, uh, they tried taking this young lady to uh, 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 a Catholic priest and you know having her exercised and all of that stuff. Absolutely no good. In fact, it made it worse. Um, and so they had a neighbor who was a dentist, who was also a spiritist, which is a, uh, let's say, uh, one of the uh, the Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean religions that uh, you know, it's founded by a guy named Alain Kardec. Kardec. That was his pen name. I, I can't remember his his big long regular name, but um, you know they're very much into uh, kind of like the spiritualists who are into the communication with the dead and, and that sort of thing. And he said, but, you know, why don't I take her into my house for a little while and and see if you know myself and some of the the people from my church can do something with her. And they were like, sure, sure, <laughs> you know, because this thing is destroying their house, right? Right. So the dentist takes this young girl into, into his home, and his home is assaulted by stones. I mean, it's not just, you know, oh, a stone pings off the roof every now and again. His home is assaulted by stones. At one point, they counted up the stones that had fallen on his house, you know, been thrown at his house, fallen on his house or whatever. And there were over 300 of these stones, right? Um, show me a, a Sasquatch that's thrown that many stones. You know, <laughs> right. I mean. You know, Playfair goes so far as to say in, in the conclusion to, to, to his book that, that stone throwing is one of the hallmarks of a poltergeist case. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh my gosh. Hmm. But just because it's outside, it has to be a bipedal primate. How does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's expectation. That's how it makes sense. You know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If you're outside and something throws a rock at you, it can't be a bear, right? Because bears don't throw rocks. So it must be a Sasquatch. Yeah. You know, if it's if it's not, you know, the, the neighborhood kids throwing rocks at you or whatever. Yeah. Um, there, there's a case in, where in, in, yeah, there's a poltergeist case that you talk about that Colin Wilson talks about where uh, Mr. Godendeek, I think his name is, tried to grab <laughs> one of the stones that was coming down in midair <laughs> and the object and avoided, avoided his hand. Him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, you know, again, you know, we've talked about this in, in other episodes. Uh, some of these stones, when people caught them or, or picked them up, were actually warm. Yeah. Um, so, and it wasn't entirely clear in, in that case whether the stones were being thrown or whether they were actually just appearing and falling out of the sky. Kind of like the uh, the white powder in the in the black monk case. Yeah, um, there's lots and lots of apport uh, activity in, in in poltergeist cases where things just seem to appear out of thin air. Yeah, or and, disappear, and, and or disappear. Yeah, um, it's like, oh, my keys are missing. <laughs> uh oh. Well, the woman's glove is a good example. Yeah, yeah. The the glove is a great example. And, and you see this in haunting cases, too, where people talk about, you know, I knew that, that, that the activity in my house was ramping up, whatever the activity was, because, you know, my keys started disappearing. I started misplacing important papers. And then I'd go back in the office and, and boom, they'd be back um, out of nowhere. I mean, I've had this happen to me. Um, you know, it's like I, I – 
I had a spouse who used to say, you know, an ex that, that used to say that living with me was a paranormal experience <laughs> because, you know, every once in a while, weird stuff like that happens around my house. You know, right. I don't even, bat, I mean, I don't battle ash at it. It's like, you know, if I'm really desperate for my keys or whatever, I just kind of look at the sky and say, I really need my keys back. Could you please give my keys back? And they'll they'll appear somewhere. They'll be sitting on the kitchen counter or something. Right, um, right. Where I know they were hanging in the closet because that's where I always put them. But, yeah. you know, it's okay. As long as they come back, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I I had a, a poltergeist-like mini outbreak where uh, the, the stereo got cranked up as I left the room. Oh, wow. And yeah. I mean, like full volume, which was pretty damn loud. And I walked back and it was ACDC. I turned it, I had muted it because I don't <laughs> like ACDC. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to mute this. And I got just outside the door of the room and suddenly it was at full volume. And I was like, holy crap. <laughs> and I walked back in and I muted it. Yeah. And then something crashes in the room I just came out of. So I walk in there and there's this large tomato grinder that was my mom's sitting in the middle of the floor. It came from the back of a shelf. <laughs> and it was heavy. I mean, there's no way this yeah. thing just slid off the shelf. Mm-hmm. And it was, even if it was light, it wouldn't have slid off the shelf. It was halfway across the room. And I was like, yeah. okay. And then the stereo cranked itself up again. And I'm like, seriously? <laughs> and I walked back in and I muted it. And I said, I don't like ACDC. Leave it muted. And it stopped. <laughs> and then a short time later, I go to do a, a show, an episode of Where Did the Road Go? And my microphone switch keeps turning itself off. Uh-huh. And it's not a switch that just randomly slides off. Like literally that is the only time it's ever done it. I've been using these mics forever. Um, Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm talking and suddenly they're like, are you still there? And I'm like, "Uh, what just happened? You know, I'm like, why is my switch off? So it was literally an inch (laughs) from my face and it turned the switch off. Yep. Yeah. Uh, my, the, the stuff that happens around me tends to be a little bit more low key than that. Um, yeah, well, I, I haven't that, had that, things go flying across the, that, yeah, that's um, probably but, the craziest yeah. poltergeist stuff I've had, honestly. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, I have enough stuff that happens every now and again, just enough to make me go, Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something going on. Okay. So All good. <laughs> so 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 let's 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 look at the nesting chapter. Mm, okay. Um, and one of the quotes that I, I highlighted here was the interesting thing about all these seeming nest sites is that the nests appear to be made with local vegetation that has been snapped off and then woven together uh, into a construct similar to that which gorillas or bears sleep. Only gorillas mm-hmm. and bears do not weave; people do. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean the the nesting. S- uh, a chapter was a little bit more difficult to write because, you know, first of all, nobody's ac- ever actually seen a Sasquatch making one of these nests. So right. the inference is that these structures, whatever, you know, whether it's an arch of, of trees or, or, uh, you know, two trees that are placed in an X or, you know, this kind of nest on the ground or that kind of thing. All of these things are just inferred that it's Sasquatch. Yeah. For all I know, the bears are doing it. You know, I mean, I mean, I I don't know. I I don't know. I mean, I've never seen a bear do it either. No, I've never seen a bear do it either. So, I mean, you know, it it could be, you know, bears are are pretty facile with their paws too. They might be snapping things off and doing things, uh, but they don't weave. Right. Um, right. That is a a, a pretty, you know, a human type phenomenon. Uh, The first thing that I point out when I'm looking at this is when you look at the, um, you know, take an overview of poltergeist lore. Um, you very quickly discover that this force is capable of moving large, heavy objects. You know, in the Black Monk case, for example, uh, Diane, the, the 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 girl, the daughter, the the uh, the family, um, has a circumstance where she's going up the stairs, and the poltergeist literally piled furniture on her. Yeah, uh, picked up several different. T- furniture pieces and heavy furniture pieces and piled them on her. Interestingly, um, they were piled in such a way that, that she wasn't hurt. Um, and the only way they could get this stuff off of her was for her to quit freaking out and panicking and relax a little bit. And when she did that, then, then the furniture would come off of her, come away from her. Um, so, this is a force in, in another case that I talk about. I think this one also came from uh, from Wilson. It was in um, it was in the United States. 
might have been in Virginia or someplace. But um, uh, in that case, a, 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 a highway patrolman who'd come to investigate this this disturbance. Um, had actually seen uh, this poltergeist move a 200-pound uh, uh, armoire across the room. Right. Yeah. You know, with yeah. You know, there's obviously nothing there to to actually uh, actually move it. Um, so this is a force that is capable of moving heavy objects. Yes. A. B. We know that it's also a force that likes to rearrange its environment. We saw this in the Olive Hill case with the whole business with the table. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. there's, there's a case that Wilson talks about where, uh, a reverend was plagued by, this is an 1800s case. Reverend, reverend is plagued by a poltergeist that likes to come into the house and create tableaus, um, where it takes like dress dummies and, you know, puts them in particular positions and has them with their prayer books and all this stuff. Again, it's mocking religion. Um, oh my gosh, it must be a demon, right? Right. Um, you know, lays the stockings out and, you know, so it's, it's created this whole, and it does these things in very short periods of time. They leave the room and five minutes later, they come back and there'd be all of this stuff arranged, you know, in the room. Um, so it's evident that, that poltergeists have a thing for rearranging their environment when they're not destroying it. Right. Yeah. Um, so I see no reason why if you take that behavior and you translate it outdoors, you wouldn't have a, a, a poltergeist, a forest poltergeist that was, uh, you know, saying, oh, well, look, these people are all talking about this giant bipedal primate and how it does nesting behaviors and, you know, relating it to how gorillas do things and all this stuff. I'm going to do that, you know, and mm-hmm. it makes a nest or, you yeah, know, the, the, uh, the thing that, that always pops into my mind when I start thinking about these nests, these flattened out areas of, of uh, vegetation and stuff is, you know, this could be the same force that's responsible for cross crop circles. Yes. You know? Yes. I was going to point um, that out because crop circles you know, also tend to have weaved like, like the, the more mm-hmm. unexplained yeah, yeah. ones. Yeah. 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 Exactly. They're, they, they're, you know, kind of all, all uh, cross hatched together. Yeah. Um, to, to, to form this structure. So we got that, um, you know, and, and this force is perfectly capable from, from what we've been able to determine just from the, the lore of, you know, taking trees, bending trees, you know, winding trees together, doing all of the kinds of things that you would see in, in, uh, you know, Sasquatch structures, because again, what do people expect to see? Yeah. It, yeah. You know, oh, this is a Sasquatch hotspot. So I would expect to see tree structures or nests or that kind of thing, or, you know, footprints or whatever it is. This force is acting according to the expectation um, yep. and doing, uh, you know, and, you know, it, it's, it's an out, it's an outdoor poltergeist. So it's going to have different behavior than an indoor poltergeist. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, you might be two species of, uh, you know, two, two different, uh, sub sub species of the same, uh, you know, uh, the same species. Yeah. I, I, I think it's just that you're, you're dealing with energy that reacts to us Mm -hmm. so some of our expectation becomes some of what we experience exactly and that's you know that's true even when we're not talking about the weird True. i mean how many how how many times you know your attitude how many times does your attitude actually create your reality you know if you're having a crappy day then crappy things tend to happen to you (laughs) that's true you know and vice versa and vice versa you know if you take that and translate it into, you know, an area where you're having these energy anomalies, whatever you want to call them, this poltergeist is, is, a, is a good uh, good handle for it. If you have these things, they're obviously responsive. We know this from the, from the lore. You know, they're obviously responsive to human behavior, human expectations. So if they're outside, they're going to have a different set of expectations than they would if they were indoors where they're supposed to be ghosties, right? Yeah. Um, and I don't think either one is is the actual form of the poltergeist. It's just we're seeing a behavior of poltergeist energy, whether it's coming from a person, yeah, exactly, or coming from something else. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, you know, go ahead. So there's a, a whole lot of of um, you know, again, you know, you could just basically call it an energetic anomaly that responds to uh, uh, to human uh, thoughts and expectations. Yeah. Uh, would be a, a, a good theory. Yeah. Now, I personally also like the idea that some poltergeist cases, at least, um, start off with 
kind of the RSPK thing where somebody's, you know, you've got the, you know, you clearly have a focus in some of these poltergeist yes, cases, definitely. you know, and so there's human agency going on there. Um, that seems to be, uh, you know, repressed emotion expressing itself outwardly in, in, as psychic phenomena. But I think that what happens in a lot of these cases and the reason that you get this ramp up uh, uh, of, uh, of activity is that that energy that this human is putting out starts to attract other energies. Um, call them spirits if you want. Yeah. Um, it starts to attract other energies. And they get in on the game and, hey, it's, a, it's loads of fun. Look at these people running around like crazy trying to figure out what's going on because I'm over here and I'm slamming things into the wall. And they come running in there and then somebody over here slams something into the wall. and They go running over there. It's like it's a great game, right? You know, I mean, you're hanging around. You're, you're, a, you're an energy of, of some type or the other. You're bored. Hey, <laughs> it's fun, right? <laughs> Let, let's, let's drive the humans crazy. Um, so I want to jump back to footprints. The next thing okay. I highlighted here was uh, you point out that the three-toed configuration of footprints is something not mm -hmm. seen on any primate. All primates, right. including right. human, have five toes. While there are many good examples of five-footed uh, or five-toed Sasquatch tracks, five-footed, that would be mm -hmm. interesting. Um, cool. We should hear these three-toed, uh, keep these, or bear these three-toed aberrations in mind. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is, and this is saying also, I think like in the lizard man case that, uh, mm -hmm. Lyle Blackburn talked about, I think it was three oh, yeah. tracks as well. Very great book. Very, very well written, well researched book, mm -hmm. the, the lizard man escape or swamp. Um, I'm a fan of Lyle Blackburn, even if he is kind of a flesh and blood kind of guy. <laughs> he's, he's leaning he, away he, from it a little he writes, bit. He is leaning he away from books. it. As as I've as I've known him, he has gone from a diehard flesh and blood to at least considering other options. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I like yeah. Lyle a lot. Yeah, it's a, it's a he's he's got a really uh, he's got a, a nice touch with his books. Yeah, but um, so tracks. Let's talk about tracks. Now, this seems to be you know if, if there's one thing that Sasquatch researchers will point to and say this must be a flesh and blood creature because it leaves tracks. Oh, kids, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but there are a lot of non-flesh and blood things that leave tracks, too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I mentioned a couple of these things already. You know, we talked about the tracks that appeared in the uh, in the Black Monk case. Right. We talked about the uh, we talked about the uh, the tracks in the uh, in, in the one haunting. Um, it, it, it is a fact that one of the old where everybody was running around with EMF meters and stuff like that was sprinkling flour on the floor to see if you got footprints. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's another case like that in the Holzer book where uh, this woman has been plagued by this, the pitter patter of little feet upstairs in, 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 in her home. And she finally goes into her bedroom and, and scatters flour and it comes back later and finds little footprints. You know, now if that happened outside, uh, you know, in certain areas, some Sasquatch researcher would be, be like, Oh, juvenile Sasquatch. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. One of my favorite Fordian uh, stories is the the uh, you know the the Devil's Trackway in uh, I think it was Devon, England, um, where the folks woke up after a snowfall and uh, I believe it was in a February, uh, woke up after a snowfall and found these hoofed tracks. Yes, the Devil's footprints. Uh, tromp, devil's footprints. Yeah, tr tromping all throughout the the, the region. Um, and the fun part about this is that it just went in a straight line wherever it wanted to go. It went, you know, if there was a house there, the tracks would disappear on the ground and then reappear on the roof and go over mm -hmm. the top of the roof and mm -hmm. just keep going. Um, but something was leaving those tracks. Now, you know, the, the materialists have tried to explain it as shrews or, you know, there's all kinds of, of funny uh, you know, I think somebody even proposed an escape kangaroo or something. But, um, you know, given the length of the trackway and the the, uh, the clarity of it, you know, it kind of vanishes as into the mists of history as one of the great mysteries because nobody really knows what made that threat made those tracks. Um, so those there's three different instances right there where quote unquote paranormal phenomena have left tracks behind. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, there's you know, also, and when I was looking for the devil's footprints at some point, I found the devil's uh, horse's hoof prints. Oh, and this is okay. from North Carolina and they've been in existence since 1813. We had, uh, talked about this on the show before. 
Um, okay. So there's a whole tradition about this guy saying, you know, he would sell it or he would, uh, where is it? Yeah. Tell me the winner of, uh, uh, what, what was it? Uh, oh, they were going to race their horses. He <laughs> said, take me in a winner or take me to hell. Promptly, the horse dug its hooves oh. into the soft earth, throwing Elliot against the tree and killing him instantly. Some believe the horse was actually the devil in the form of a horse, but there are these depressions, um, mm-hmm. these holes, and they're located just off of North Carolina 11, or, uh, 1334, about 3.3 miles west of Bath. They've survived every known attempt to permanently eradicate or alter them. <laughs> Although the holes Fun. are located at the edge of a forested area, no vegetation grows inside them. None of the pine needles from the thick mats surrounding the holes ever remains in the earthen saucers. On their way to school, children have deposited various kinds of debris into the depressions, only to find that the holes are empty upon returning from school. Countless visitors to the site have experienced the same phenomena. Scientists have conducted studies at the site to provide an objective explanation of the intriguing holes. Among the most popular theories of the depressions are vents for a subterranean water pocket or the results of salt veins. But what they look like are little hoof prints measuring four <laughs> to five inches deep with sloping sides from 10 to six inches. The holes, yeah, the holes remain one of North Carolina's most famous and enduring mysteries. I had never heard of this. No, my, me neither. I, um, you know, it, which brings to mind another uh, track making uh, instance that uh, from a very famous witch in, or very, very famous poltergeist case in, in Kentucky, Bell Witch. Um, there's, you know, after the, uh, the original Bell died, the, the Bell Witch appeared to Junior and said, you know, uh, I'm going to make tracks that, that uh, look like your, your father's boot right, prints. Right, right. And tracks appeared outside. Um, he didn't actually go out there and compare them to his father's boot prints. But, um, you know, the fact is there were tracks out there. Yeah. This force, this energy, whatever it was, was leaving tracks behind. Yep. Um, so, you know, even the, 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 uh, the, the thing that people consider the, the crown uh, proof of, of Sasquatch, even those things are things that pop up in, in poltergeist cases, in yep. haunting cases. You know, it, we see this kind of thing all the time. All right. um, we got to take a quick break. So we sure. got, We'll take a quick break and we'll be right back with Travis. All right, quick break here to give you some contact info and a recommendation. WhereDidTheRoadGo.com is where you can find all your Where Did The Road Go stuff, all our social media links, emails, um, my Amazon wish list, if you feel kind and want to buy me something, um, everything. Everything is there, and particularly the email for stories. So if you have a story you want to tell us about uh, for a listener stories episode, stories at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com is the email to use. That is also linked at wheredotheroadgo.com, where you can also become a patron and help support the show. And it's only $3 a month, and you get a lot of extra content. Uh, You can also check out my music show. It's mostly metal, with a little bit of like goth, industrial, punk, and comedy music, and other weird stuff, eclectic stuff, all kind of mixed together. It's called The Last Exit for the Lost. You can find that at thelastexit.org. There's an archive of shows going all the way back to 1996. Not a complete archive, but there are shows going all the way back to 1996. Um, yeah, where you can listen to new shows. Okay, as for recommendations, um, something that we may have talked about in this show or maybe on the Patreon segment, um, Nandar Fodar and the Talking Mongoose. I sat down and watched this this last week, and it's the story of Jeff the Mongoose which is a very, uh, to me, one of my favorite poltergeist cases. It stars Simon Pegg, Minnie Driver, and Christopher Lloyd, and uh, it's good. I really enjoyed it. Um, I felt like they did a really good job with it. I noticed on the uh, Fortiana news group that people were complaining about the way they presented it, but with a story like that, you got to throw some quirkiness in, and it's a quirky story to begin with. It's listed as a comedy. It's not really a comedy. Like I said, it's more quirky. Uh, But it does that that, that good fine line of, well, maybe this stuff is explainable, but maybe it's not. And interestingly, uh, before Travis and I recorded, we had a conversation talking about the very type of conversation that happens at the beginning of this movie, and neither of us had seen it, uh, which is uh, him being asked if he believes in ghosts and why that's not a very good question. 
So, uh, yeah, I totally recommend it. I thoroughly enjoyed this movie, and it's uh, it's right on topic for the stuff we cover on this show. And for some reason, Jeff the Mongoose has been coming up a lot lately, not in relation to this movie. So, uh, I don't know. Maybe he's out there knocking on something. All right. Back to the show. All right. So, we are here on Where the Road Go talking with Travis Watson about his latest book, The, the uh, Forest Poltergeist. And I cut you off there. Do you, you remember have to what stop you were going to say? Think about that for a minute. <laughs> Do what? Uh, I cut you off just as we were going to break. Did did do you want to? No, no, no. I was just saying okay. that you know. I mean, something that I keep reiterating throughout this talk and throughout the book is is you know, I mean, if you show me something that Sasquatch is supposed to do out in the woods, I can show you a poltergeist case where the poltergeist yeah. did something very similar to that. Yep. You know, or yep. at least I can show you that a poltergeist would be capable of doing that. Right. You know? Right. I mean, so it, it becomes very clear that, um, you know, I mean, we have a certain one of the things that I comment on in Sasquatch Canada, which is the book that was that I wrote before this, um, is that a lot of Sasquatch sightings, the, the visual class A sightings, um, are very uh, almost mundane, you know, it's like, oh, da, 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 I was, I was out in the forest, I was hunting, and, um, you, you know, I saw the Sasquatch, and you could as easily substitute in bear or mountain lion or whatever, right. you know, I saw an unusual animal in the woods, um, you know, and then you get the weird ones where, you know, I saw the Sasquatch walking down the road, and as I was watching, it became more and more translucent, and then it disappeared. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that we have to do as researchers is keep an open mind about all kinds of stuff. Instead of saying, well, it must be a flesh and blood creature, I can say, well, yeah, some of these sightings certainly seem to be of a flesh and blood creature. You know, something that runs out of the woods, grabs a deer, you know, breaks its neck and then runs back into the woods. You know, I mean, there's certainly evidence that uh, certain beings of the other side can assume physical form. But I would think that, um, you know, in, in this circumstance, that that particular being may have been an actual flesh and blood critter right. um, that, that, that did this thing. But, you know, the Sasquatch phenomena has become so widespread now that I can't see how this rare creature is in all of these places all of the time. <laughs> you know, because if you look at even just the BFRO database, you know, I mean, there are Sasquatches everywhere. Yeah, that's the <laughs> I mean, thing. the only place they don't have any sightings is in Hawaii. You know, and, and I presume that's just because Sasquatch hasn't figured out how to get on a cruise ship yet. You know? <laughs> I mean, they're everywhere, you know, in every state of the union, in all kinds of different um, uh, environments. It's you know? actually I mean, surprising it, it, that there's any state that doesn't have them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, because I mean, if you think about I, I lived in Arizona, uh, I lived in Arizona for 13 years. You know, you have Sasquatch sightings in Arizona. This is not a place, yeah, I mean, up in, in Prescott and in places like that, forest country, up in the Ponderosa Pines and stuff, yeah, I could see where maybe some kind of a big critter could, could hide itself. But these things are seen down in the desert. Um, you know, uh, they're seen on, like, the Navajo Reservation, where there's no place to hide. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean... A creature that big is going to have a lot of trouble concealing itself in a desert environment. Yeah, but still, people see them. So I got to think that there's something more going on than just a flesh and blood creature. I got to think that that there's there's you know another energy at work there um, that's creating a lot of this class B stuff that we're talking about, and that's probably creating some of these sightings in, in an apparitional form. Um, just because you see a Sasquatch doesn't necessarily mean that it's a flesh and blood creature. Um, but if you study apparitions, um, it's very common for someone to encounter an apparition and think that they are talking to or interacting with a real human, you know, like an actual human being, for instance. Um, you know, they wake up and there's somebody standing at the foot of their bed. And to, to them, this person is as real as, you know, the person that they share the house with. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the same uh, circumstance, I, I got to think that, that this energy is probably capable of producing apparitions that people see um, so that you get Sasquatches wandering around in the desert or Sasquatches wandering the plains of Alberta 
uh, you know, grasslands and places where you wouldn't expect a large creature that's known for its hide and seek behavior to be seen. Yep. Yep. So I, I yeah. just Googled, uh, Hawaii monster encounters oh, Okay. and there's quite a few of them. Uh, and this one I'm looking at right here says it's often said that Bigfoot has never been sighted or has been sighted in every state except Hawaii. However, this is not exactly true. As bizarre as it may seem, there are ample reports of at least two types of hairy hominids lurking about the wilds oh. of Hawaii as well. Perhaps the most often dis- discussed of these is an alleged race of hairy dwarves known to the mm-hmm. islanders as Menhuen, Men Menahun, I think. Uh, Men- Menahune? Yeah, that might. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Two to three feet uh, tall. Which stout, ties into, yeah. Uh, and the other, Go ahead. let's see, uh, they're skilled as builders. Um, looking for the other type. Um, there, there's a, there are women creatures that seem almost like chupacabras. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, it's not that you're not getting the giant Bigfoots. You're getting like the small Bigfoots. Mm-hmm. Getting like the little foot kind. Yeah, kind of like the Albatwitch <laughs> in uh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The 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 Menehunes is, is is associated with um, uh, kind of the one of the the Hawaiian um, fairy lore yeah. kind of of creatures. Um, so yeah, I mean, but you know, but I'm sure of... that there's somebody out there who said, "Oh well, you know, this must be a, a you know a remnant population of tiny Sasquatches or something," you know, because. Um, well, People have Sasquatch on the brain. Right, right. And and but I'm I'm thinking that maybe because the culture is a little bit different in Hawaii than most of the other uh, mm-hmm. you know states, that they're not seeing the exact same type of Bigfoot. I mean, even in the U.S., the types of Bigfoot vary by the area. Oh yeah, you know, because you yeah. got the skunk I mean, ape your, and the swamp ape and yeah, all your, this. You know, your swamp apes look a lot different from your your giant you know uh, northwest. Um, you know, Northwest region uh, Sasquatches that are wandering around in the the Olympic uh, rainforest and stuff. Right, um, right. Yeah, you know, they're they're they seem to adapt regionally, um, and whether that's you know a uh, uh, an evolutionary adaptation or an energetic adaptation, I couldn't tell you. But <laughs> or or an expectation. I, what now? An, an expectation. expectation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you, you, you do a chapter on vocalizations. And, of course, that's a big thing mm-hmm. with Bigfoot hunters is, you know, you can hear these vocalizations. And they're mimics. And this is one of the things that stands out to me. They, they'll say, oh, Bigfoot can mm-hmm. mimic voices. Well, that is one of the prime talents of a poltergeist <laughs> is mimicry. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, go ahead. You talk about a case uh, from uh, researched by Catherine Crow, uh, mm-hmm. a nineteen or sixteen seventy poltergeist case in the village of Kepok, yep. um, mm-hmm. and it had stone throwing mayhem, and the energy was recorded as speaking to the witness, though it was never seen. Yep. Yeah. So, Catherine Crow is one of those um, uh, hidden treasures of, of parapsychology. Um, she's a very early um, ghost hunter, basically. Um, who wrote a, a really excellent book called The Night Side of Nature that, that I highly recommend to people mm. because it is, it is, I mean, it's one of the classics of the literature. I mean, it's, it's like Terrell's apparitions. Um, you know, it, it's just chock full of interesting stories <laughs> about, you know, uh, all kinds of, you know, not just about poltergeist. It's also about, uh, you know, just general hauntings of all sizes, shapes, and colors. A fascinating, fascinating book if you ever have a chance to, to get into it. Um, but, yeah. you know, because everybody thinks that, you know, the original ghost hunters were, you know, these these frumpy old white guys who were running around, you know, trying to scientifically prove that ghosts existed and, you know, forming psychical research societies, um, Catherine Crow doesn't get much, much airtime. Right. Um, I, I'd love to see that change um, because her work is definitely worth looking at um, she cites some really interesting cases but yeah you know the the cap the cap cases is is a uh, you know again it's a classic poltergeist case where you know there's all these disturbances there's broken crockery there's there's all of this stuff happening there's things moving around and so forth and in addition we have something that's talking yeah and this is not you know and you know if you you get uh, people talking about uh, uh, sasquatch vocalizations 
you know, what are the things people are talking about? They're talking about the big old yell, right? The big, uh, the big mm-hmm. scream that people hear, uh, that, that's, you know, so supposed to come from like a giant chest and, and that sort of thing. We get the, the, uh, what was it? Uh, the Sierra sounds called it samurai chatter. Yes. Um, which there is an example of in my book, Sasquatch Canada, where a special operations soldier in Canada is camped out in uh, Ontario, uh, in Northern Ontario. I uh, was on security duty one night and um, <clears throat> actually was hearing a sound that sound, he said it sounded to him like somebody standing off in the distance speaking Japanese. Yeah. But he couldn't make out individual words, right? And he was all over his security area trying to figure out where the hell the sound was coming from and couldn't find it, right? Um, so we have a Class B encounter. He didn't see anything um, that involves vocalizations, you know? Now, everybody would say, oh, well, there was a Sasquatch in the wood there. It could just as easily have been our our forest poltergeist because we also have situations where poltergeists have, uh, in the Black Monk case, the poltergeist was uh, at one point making farm animal noises. Yeah. Um, uh, we also see the poltergeist making uh, uh, various kinds of noises, including the ringing of a bell um, in the loot hold case from, from the Holzer book. Um, <clears throat> You know, in the uh, the case that ev- eventually became Geff the mongoose, uh, it starts off with scratching and so forth underneath the uh, the uh, the floor of this house, and then uh, moves into a, a chattering, an animal chattering kind of thing. The fellow that lived there was an expert kind of in game calls and started doing these calls, uh, and, and this thing was able to, to uh, imitate all of his different game calls that he did before it started doing the whole mongoose thing. Yeah, um, yeah. This is, this is kind of a precursor to the whole mongoose thing. That was the, that was the main story. But uh, you know, before all that happened, we had a poltergeist that was imitating uh, game calls. Um, you know, so again, the poltergeist displays itself as an energy that is capable of doing all kinds of different stuff. I talk about the apparition that you know screams so loud it actually set somebody back on his you know back on his heels. Um, you know from the from the tarot book. Yeah, you know, again, these energies are capable of doing some really interesting things, and if you take that being. And you put it, that energy or being, and you put it outside, you know, where it has all kinds of different critters to imitate. There's no telling what kind of sounds you're going to get out there. Well, that's it. You know, from from a baby crying to uh, to the chatter thing to the screams in the night to howls. Uh, you know, and, and if we assume that this energy has access to the uh, the sound prints of you know animals across the world you know it could be imitating elephants or something for all True. we know. True. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, um, you have a case here from apparitions, um, mm-hmm. which uh, GNM Tyrell tells of a landover who who partly who parted curtly from his tenant one day. Later that day, about 2,200 hours, the landlord was standing in his breakfast room when he distinctly heard the sound of his front gate opening and shutting with a clap. This sound was followed by the sound of running footsteps on the front walk. The landowner was, land was very conscious of a presence just beyond the window where he stood, and he could hear labored breathing as though someone was catching their breath after exerting themselves. You remember the rest of this one? Yeah, yeah. This is the story that I was talking about. The, the landowner is standing at the window. Um, he and his tenant had had a pretty serious argument that afternoon. Um, and so he hears a clack. Okay, so you got a wood knock. Mm-hmm. Okay. He hears footsteps, another classic class B thing. I heard bipedal footsteps tromping around in my camp, right? Um, he's conscious that there's something uh, beyond the window where he's standing, but he doesn't see anything. So that feeling of being watched, right, which yep. is another classic yep. of class B encounters. And then something screams at him, and it screams so loud that it, he literally takes a step back. Um, the interesting thing about this is that his wife was sitting in the same room with him and heard absolutely nothing. Yeah. So, um, you know. And, and it wasn't a single shriek, but a more prolonged, no. commencing in a high yeah, key, just, less and less wailing away toward the north and becoming weaker and weaker as it receded. 
on sobbing pulsations yep. of intense agony, as it's described. Yes, yeah. And and the the follow up to that is a very typical you know ghost story kind of thing. Apparently, the tenant can, committed suicide that night. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's just one example of a, a paranormal phenomena that made a really loud noise. You know, there's other haunting, uh, you know, instances where you know there's the sound of people's voices. There's the sound of wailing. You know, I mean, the 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 classic ghost that, that wanders along, moaning and groaning. Right. Um, all of these things are examples of paranormal phenomena actually making sounds. Yes. Yeah. And there's no reason why. There's no reason why. Uh, you know, you can't have a situation where you move this energy out, outdoors. You know, everybody says, "Oh well, if I hear these sounds in the woods, it must be Sasquatch." But why? Because it, it's more than evident that you know the poltergeist phenomena, paranormal phenomena in general, are very capable of making a wide range of sounds. Yeah, you know? and some of those things have even been recorded. You know? Yeah. So oh, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> So, so I, I mean, again, you know, yes, there could be a bipedal primate out there making noise, but it could also be a, uh, a rather interesting energy that's decided that it's going to have some fun with people. You also, you also uh, in one of the chapters, talk about um, uh, Steve Savdal, an author writing about the mm -hmm. use of the Lesser Key of Solomon, uh, which is the Goetia, right. uh, talks about his right. experience in invoking one of these spirits, and you show some connections here, too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, this is, again, a, a very, uh, it's not a classic case of poltergeist no. activity, but this is a situation where somebody actually decided that they were going to do this work, this magical work. And, uh, and that magical work involved summoning a spirit into the temple that they had set up in their, um, uh, set up in their basement, basically. Um, now, what happens, though, is that things go a little off the rails. Um, you know, if you talk to uh, uh, Christopher Wren, I'm sure he'd be happy to tell you some stories about things that went off the rails. <laughs> but in this particular circumstance, uh, this ritual, for whatever reason, uh, went a little bit off the rails, I think because mostly because of the reaction that the the workers had, the, the people that were doing the, the ritual had to the energy as it came into the room. Um, it's not uncommon uh, for these types of energies, which in the Galatia are, often, are referred to as demons, although uh, we're probably not talking about the classic Christian fallen angel type demon. Right, this is, right something far older, right? Um, I don't want to get into the whole, you know, it's not demons lecture. But, right. yeah. um, so that some of the say it's not, not uncommon for these beings to manifest and just scare the crap out of people. Um, I know there's a, a and I'm trying, I can't think who it is off the top of my head, but there's a, a, a working magician out there who refers to, I think it's um, Andrea Vitimus who refers to it as a, an allergy. In other words, your energy and the energy of whatever it is that you've summoned just don't get along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And that often manifests as a, as a feeling of terror or anxiety, right? Yep. So when this thing started to, to manifest, these guys felt this terror or anxiety, and they called it into the to the ritual. Now, to their credit, they shut down properly um, instead of just going, oh, my God, running out of the circle and running upstairs, <laughs> right, which would have been really catastrophic. Uh, they, they shut down properly, but they were still aware of this uh, presence in the house. Um, and, you know, they had... They did something like a hundred vanishing rituals before they finally got the, the the presence out of the house to 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 leave them be. But during the time that it was there, this this being was was pretty much uh, manifesting in a very poltergeisty sort of way. Um, you know, it was there were things moving around the house. You know, there was that feeling of being watched. Uh, there were. Uh, I'm trying to remember if there were vocalizations in that one. Uh, is that why you bought that one up? Or uh, I think I brought it up. I, I took it off the screen. Hang on a second here. <laughs> and now um, my tablet's not cooperating. Um, of course. I brought it up uh, because uh, because it was also an example of the Oz effect. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, well, and, and we see the Oz effect happening in, in, uh, in Sasquatch lore all the time. You know, people, you know, you have that unreasoning sense of, of something going on, right? Right. Um, the Oz effect, for those who may not be familiar, although if you've listened to this show, you've probably heard us talk about it a number of times, <laughs> but something that Jenny Randall came up with, uh, Randall's came up with in, um, in doing UFO research. Um, and describes an effect that she saw in UFO witnesses where, um, you know, their, their sightings were preceded by, A, a feeling that something was going to happen, uh, which we see a lot in, in Sasquatch lore. You know, there's a feeling that something is going to happen, something's, uh, somebody's watching me, uh, you know, a, a feeling of unease, right? Uh, B, what I have dubbed the silence, where uh, it's almost as if you've been encased in a bubble. Um, and that the, the real world is out there and you're in here and everything is quiet in here. Uh, yeah. All the background noises, all the ambient noises, bird sounds, all that sort of thing, which again is very common in Sasquatch uh, encounters. Uh, all of those no noises fade into the background and everything becomes very quiet. And then the third thing is time distortion. Um, you know, of course, in, in UFO cases, you see that a lot with uh, who have missing time or who think that they were looking at this object for five minutes and then they realize that an hour has passed, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, maybe not so common in, in, in the Sasquatch lore, but it's not unheard of. No. And, uh, and you know, in the case of, you know, I can think of at least one case where the fellow was uh, trying to get from his uh, uh, deer blind to his truck and it took him an abnormally long period of time to do it uh, after having a, a Sasquatch encounter yeah. where, if I remember right, the thing reached up and grabbed his foot. Um, mm. But, yeah, I mean, this is, I think that, I forget what book that was in, but um, I don't know if that was one of my books or somebody else's book. <laughs> it definitely uh, sounds familiar. Yeah, I, I know I've, I've, I've seen it somewhere, <laughs> whether it was in research or whether I actually wrote it in, in a book <laughs> myself. But. You know, after you've done several of these books, you know, people think, oh, well, you know, you should have a mastery of this topic. It's like, no, I don't. I have this jumble of stuff in my yeah. head that I see it just kind of randomly pops up. And I'm like, OK, yeah. Well, we're but out of going back to. Well, we're out of time. Ahead. So why don't you tell oh, people? Shoot. OK. And we'll continue. We'll continue. I have a few more things I want to talk about in a Patreon, but tell people sure. the books and uh, how to find you and follow you. Okay. So the, the, the latest book is the forest poltergeist. Um, and as with all of my books, it's available on Amazon. It's available as a paperback or a Kindle. And if you happen to be a Kindle unlimited member, you can read it for free. Nice. Um, well, for however much you, you pay for your Kindle unlimited. Um, I'm pretty easy to find, um, on, uh, Facebook. You can find me on the WT Watson author page. Or if you're looking for my personal account, I'm Will Watson, uh, which is one of those weird weirdities that uh, you know keeps my man of mystery thing going. Um, it's a long, long story, but it has to do with an X and all that kind of stuff. And I won't get into it. Um, on Twitter, I'm uh, at WT Watson two, if I remember right. And then if you're looking on Instagram, which I have trouble with, but I manage to post once in a while. <laughs> I am. Uh, this is an old handle that I was using before I was ever an author. It's a uh, Curanir C U R U N I R uh, six zero. Um, so you can find me on on Instagram. Uh, you can probably just find me by searching for one of my books, and it'll pop up. But yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm I'm available on social media. I I love hearing from people. Um, you know, I sometimes have people you know approach me with witness stuff, and that's great. But um, I I just like to hear from people who've read books and are interested in these topics too. So feel free to follow me and you know, and and interact if you get a chance. All right, thank you for doing this part too. And like I said, there's a few more things I want to talk to you about in the Patreon, but uh, sure. this has been a great conversation. Oh, yeah. Always a good time, Stry. Thanks so much for having me. I want to take a moment here to give a shout out to all of my Patreons, because without you, this show would not be possible. And a special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Greg Ross, Illuminati, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Stephen St. George, 36 Dingo, Tim, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul. Midnight Review presents Christine, 
a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Andrew Malone, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Lemina, Bright Rectangle, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy and Communicable, CJ, Greg Parmenter, Diane B, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, History and Coffee, J, J Otto Bullock, Jack Huntington, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Mattingly, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L, Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Linda, Linz Jackson K, MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Mr. Weird, Oli Andre Olar, Paul Jeffries, Perry Peters, Philosopher of Mirrors, Riker and Stark, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Schmooples, Devourer of Mortal Souls, Stacy Sherwood, Stevie Norman, Strange Stories with the Seeker and Skeptic Podcast, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Varosh K, Vincent Trewell, Will Gebhardt, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Annabelle Smith, Caroline Walker, TDT Skunk Works, and Craig Sagastumi. Thank you all so very much. There is a Patreon segment to go along with this show, which Patreons will be getting in a few days. Um, if you want to become a Patreon, it's only $3 a month, and it helps us out immensely. So uh, please consider donating. Uh, if you just want to donate as well, uh, you can do that at wheretheroadgo.com, as well as become a patron, as well as listen to any show over the last 10 years or so. I want to shoot a uh, thank you to some new Patreons. Uh, Alex Cursonis, who I may have thanked last week. I can't remember. And Gonzo Fluffy Buns. I like that one. All right, cool. Thank you guys for joining up. I hope you like the extra content. I'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>